was to safely resume in-person learning for all Scarborough students. Our staff continue to collaborate and prepare for fully in-person learning in September with the overall health, safety, and well-being of our school community first and foremost in our minds. Um, Diane and I really want to walk through kind of uh, the highlights of this plan and then, and then open it up for discussion as part of the workshop format. And then also, um, I'm really appreciative of um, April reaching out to board members too to, to, to give us a list of questions ahead of time. That was really helpful. So there's also um, a frequently asked questions document. A lot of questions that parents have been um, asking too are similar. So I think that was really helpful for us to also be able to anticipate and answer some of those questions as part of this. Um, the first part of the plan. So our primary goal is, as stated, is to get all of our students back in classrooms full time. Um, the first part of that is following the main um, federal recommendation by the um, CDC as well as the main CDC, and that's a universal masking requirement. So all students, staff, and visitors to Scarborough Public School buildings will be required to wear a mask while indoors. Uh, this requirement is consistent with main CDC and federal CDC guidance. Due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, CDC recommends universal indoor masking by all students, staff, teachers, and visitors to K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. Returning all students safely, the fully in-person instructions are our number one priority. So that's the, um, the first part of our reopening plan with respect to COVID. Um, there's also a lot of things uh, in our facilities as we, as we prepare. Um, necessary equipment, materials, supplies for supporting health and safety guidelines. Uh, we'll continue with signage in all common areas and classrooms, reminding students and staff of health and safety routines, wearing masks, um, maintaining physical distance uh, when possible, washing and sanitizing hands frequently. The HVAC in all buildings, um, Todd's at, he's really adjusted uh, to optimize incoming airflow, HEPA air filtration units have been provided to every occupied space and all units have had new filters installed over the summer. Uh, all water fountains have been replaced or converted to being bottle filling stations. That's gonna be completed by early fall. Um, plans, there's some adjustments to our cafeteria usage. So K to five and middle school will have pre-ordered bag lunches. High school salad bars and delis will be open as normal with extra precautions. Um, a la carte items will also be available. Transportation, we're gonna operate buses at full capacity. Um, per the federal CDC requirements, all students and staff will wear masks while in any district vehicles. Um, Diane, I don't know if you wanna to touch on the, the transportation survey that we put out. Sure, um, so as many of you uh, may know, uh, not just in Scarborough, but uh, across the state and uh, the US actually, there is a shortage of bus drivers. And so um, we have been in this uh, situation for uh, the, this is our second school year in a, low, in a row. We operated last year, three bus drivers short all year. And so it was really important for us as we're returning back to school to do a transportation survey so that we can assess our ability to transport all of our students back and forth to school safely. And so um, you can take a look at the percentages. Um, this survey, I believe, is, is still open. I, um, these are the latest results as of this morning. Um, but you can see this, these are the percentages of families that are looking at utilizing um, the school district for transportation. Um, and as Jeff said, everyone will be masked on buses. That's a federal requirement. We will also continue to have seating charts on buses uh, because we have to have those available for contact tracing purposes. Um, and again, um, our, our why in doing this transportation survey is so that our transportation director, Sarah Redman, and um, her staff can take a look at the needs and assess um, the ability and uh, the number of bus runs and how that will all work. So that is all still in process, um, but certainly we are several bus drivers short at this time, I think probably about six drivers short. Last year we ran three bus drivers short. And so we really are at a, a bit of a critical impasse when it comes to transportation. 
Yeah, and, and as we open educating staff, families, and students, um, we, you know, not a lot of the health and safety requirements are going to be new to people. So it's it's just reinforcing again uh, the masking indoors um, and and health and safety guidelines that we've gotten used to over the course of uh, the last year and, and a little bit, and then also continuing to communicate expectations with regard to a daily health screening and self check prior to arriving on campus. Um, with respect to responding to positive cases, so this is where there, there have been some pretty significant changes to the standard operating procedure that the main CDC um, requires us to do when we have a positive case in a school building. And um, some of those changes in the standard operating procedure are also part of um, some of the recommendations that we've made as part of this plan, particularly with uh, requiring masks for all students regarding, uh, regardless of vaccination status, as well as the pooled testing. So the goal really has been to encourage districts to require masking and, and then also implement pooled testing and, and limit uh, the number of students who are in quarantine as, as close contacts. So um, in, in terms of who's determining uh, when someone is a close contact, um, that's similar to has, how it's been in terms of um, consult, consultation with uh, Maine DOE and CDC and our, our school nurses really are um, uh, the, the, the central part of that process. Um, some of the changes uh, in the close contacts and quarantine, Diane, I wonder if you'd, you'd kind of yeah. focus on that a little bit because that's, that's very significant and different from last year. Sure, so um, I actually lifted this table off of the most recent um, update to the uh, main center of disease control and prevention standard operating procedure. Um, it is a document for how schools uh, need to respond to positive cases. And this just actually came out uh, this past Friday. So um, there are several different scenarios and you can see that they've been outlined in this table. The first is um, anyone who is fully vaccinated would not be subject to quarantine unless of course they were a person who also tested positive. Um, if you are a close contact and you have tested positive for COVID in the last 90 days, you are also not subject to quarantine. Um, that was similar to last year as well. Um, uh, a new exception this year is pooled testing. And I know that we've put out a lot of information to the community about pooled testing and we've done some surveying and I'll share those results with you um, in a few minutes. But um, if someone chooses, because again, pooled testing is not mandatory, it is by parent choice. Um, if a parent chooses to enroll their child into pooled testing, which would happen once a week, and their child happens to be a close contact, their child would not be subject to classroom quarantine. They would also not be subject to quarantine of any um, after school activities or athletics. Uh, the fourth ex exception is around the universal masking. Any schools who institute universal masking um, any students who are named as close contacts are not subject to quarantine during the school day. However, they may not participate in school related sports and activities. Again, these are um, regulations from the main Center for Disease Control. Um, these are not our local um, regulations or decisions. And so this is what we're going to need to follow. And depending on what things from that table we uh, decide to approve or endorse, um, then situations change for students accordingly. Um, if we do not have a universal masking mandate, um, students who are unvaccinated or any person who is unvaccinated would be subject to quarantine. And we know that that was a very difficult um, and challenging thing for both students and staff last year. And so we're excited about some of these changes because again, as Jeff said, these help us to get to our goal of keeping students in school 
on a more continuous basis. So in regards to the pooled testing, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because again, I know that we have pushed out a lot of education this summer to families about this. Um, and uh, we sent home a slide deck along with a survey, but um, weekly pooled testing will be available for students and staff who elect to participate in that. Um, some of the benefits for people participating in pooled testing include um, that it tests individuals before they might show any symptoms. And so as such decreases the contagion for everyone in the school community. Uh, regular testing has been shown to slow the spread of the virus and going and checking on a regular basis also helps to communicate confidence to the community that, um, that we are safe. Um, it is another mitigation layer in addition to universal masking. Um, that again, if you read um, a lot of the literature, it really does talk about um, multiple measures and layers of mitigation. Um, this does provide for more continuity of in-person instruction because, um, you know, again, people participating would not be subject to quarantine. It allows those students to continue to participate in school-related sports and activities. I know that um, having to close down activities and sports um, at different points in time during the last school year really presented a lot of challenges. Um, it really affected many of our students in terms of their mental health and um, you know, their ability to be with their peers. And weekly testing protocols are relatively simple and minimally disruptive for students. Um, pool testing is at no cost to Scarborough Public Schools. Um, and so um, again, I just reiterated there that students who participate in pool testing can attend school and participate in after school activities. Um, it limits isolation and quarantine from school. Um, the only people who would have to um, either quarantine or isolate from school would be the individual who does test positive for COVID clearly um, and anyone who is unvaccinated and who does not participate in pool testing and is deemed a close contact would have to quarantine um, in regards to the after school piece. Um, Scarborough Public Schools also, when we were budgeting our SR3 funds this spring, um, we did allocate and set aside some funds to um, hire an individual to help us um, manage and run the pooled testing in the case that um, we, might have, we might make the decision to follow through with that. And so um, obviously since this plan has not been uh, approved or endorsed, we haven't moved forward in terms of um, you know, posting that position at, that, at this time. Um, our pooled testing survey results um, again, we pushed out a survey because we felt really strongly that it wasn't up to us to make a decision for, for parents, whether or not they wanted their child to um, have the opportunity to take part in pooled testing. We felt like we needed to push that out to the community um, to get a sense of where the community was. And so um, if you take a look um, at these results, this is a closed um, survey. The survey closed last week. Um, and we got responses on behalf of 12, just over 1200 students in our district and 66% of those responses expressed interest overall. 16% um, of folks indicated that they did not want their child participating and 17% um, said that they were not sure at this time. Um, and then you can also see, I have another chart where there's a breakdown by school, um, but certainly there is a pretty consistent trend of um, families that are interested in um, enrolling their children for pool testing. And, and just as a reminder, um, they would have to opt in by a very specific form. So their answer on the survey doesn't, necess doesn't automatically place them into pool testing. Um, there would be some form, some formalities in that, 
and um, parents can also opt in or opt out at any time. So it is not a one-time sign up. Um, and so those are things that uh, definitely work in um, everyone's best interest. So it's, it's, you know, it's not a lifetime decision. Yeah, and, and we wanted to also outline as part of the plan that, that you know, what, what will return to classrooms full-time feel like and look like. And outside of the masks, there's a lot of things that will, will, will continue as, uh, as they did pre-COVID. So um, school calendar day schedules, attendance expectations will be maintained. Uh, we're returning to full-time in-person classroom instruction. There may be some possible adjustments to start and stop times. Uh, if needed, you know, due to some of the transportation constraints or, or just some logistics, um, school practices and policies related to learning expectations will be maintained. You know, like I said, students, staff and visitors while indoors will be required to wear masks. Um, there, there will be opportunities for IP 504 teams um, to meet via Zoom, but also meet uh, in person. If there are um, some students for medical or, or IEP reasons require remote services. Um, that's a possibility. We're gonna continue to um, maintain seating charts in classrooms, uh, cafeteria and on buses for contact tracing reasons. Um, special services, continue to provide FAPE to all students on IEP and 504 plans. Um, meetings will continue to be facilitated remotely via the Zoom, Zoom platform. Families will have the option for in-person meetings with proper health and safety protocols followed. We'll continue to, uh, student data will continue to be collected to identify and develop specialized instruction. Um, 504 long-term medical disability needs impacted by COVID uh, might be present in certain students, including the potential of remote services, initial referral testing, and will continue to be scheduled neither in person or via Zoom and Google Meets platforms. With respect to response to intervention and RTI, that support will continue as designated. Uh, students will be assessed and determination will be made initially in the fall and then an ongoing basis as needed. This process will continue um, our a team approach. So a lot of, a lot of things um, will resume uh, as, they, as they were, as they were uh, proceeding pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, as far as activities and athletics, uh, um, the same, health, you know, physical health and safety standards apply to our, um, to our after school extracurriculars and athletics. Uh, it's very, very consistent. So um, not, not a whole lot to add on, on that front. And as um, Diane mentioned, for students who, uh, who choose to enroll in the pooled testing, uh, if you are deemed a close contact and you're not vaccinated, you still can continue um, to come to school and also participate in your extracurricular and athletic programs. Uh, also just wanted to point out uh, um, grant funding and some of the ESSER funds, uh, as we touched on a little bit in the pool testing, um, a lot of the federal grant funds for this upcoming year uh, will be spent on supplemental positions to allow for some smaller class sizes and extra support both academically and for uh, social emotional needs as we re uh, return full time to in-person school. Um, so uh, we added five teacher positions to allow for these smaller class sizes, particularly at Wentworth and the middle school. And then also additional grant funds used for a classroom, one, uh, three one-year classroom teacher positions for grades K to five, uh, one-year high school RTI and credit recovery support specialist, one year transition specialist position to coordinate learning continuity, um, one year, and then also a one year pooled testing coordinator position uh, if the pooled testing plan is adopted. And as, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do have a link to our frequently asked questions document, uh, which was the 17 questions that was shared by board members ahead of time. And, and that we've responded to in writing. So we've shared that document as well. I'm also wondering if this might um, be a good time to have our district physician, Dr. Fanberg, just offer um, his insight about our plan. Um, I did um, share our proposal with him in advance of our meeting tonight so that he could look that over carefully and offer feedback 
um, to the group. I'd be happy to speak if that's okay. Perfect. That'd Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Fanberg. Thank you. I'm John Fanberg. I'm a pediatrician. I'm also an adolescent medicine subspecialist at Maine Medical Center. Uh, I am the school physician for Scarborough Schools. Uh, Thank you for letting me talk. Um, I last spoke to the school board a year ago and COVID's still here. Sorry for that news. The bad news is that Delta variant is on an uptick as far as positivity for infections. Um, but the good news is we're smarter now than we were a year ago. We understand what prevents it to some more extent. We have better data supporting what we're doing and vaccines exist. Uh, Vaccinations may be the most important prevention from getting serious disease from COVID. And I can't emphasize that strong enough for anybody who's capable of getting the vaccine to get the vaccine. It dramatically reduces your risk of getting the infection and it's not perfect. You still can get the infection as smaller percent. And if you do get the infection, you're less likely to be hospitalized. And if you are hospitalized, you're less likely to die from the infection. The second most important thing I can say is masking. Masking decrease the risk of getting infection and giving infection. Those are my two most important pieces of armatorium as far as preventing this disease. And although I'd like to say that kids don't get COVID, we know they do. And we actually pulled some data for this meeting. Um, I, I sit in a practice of five different sites around the greater Portland, pediat greater Portland area. And um, I looked at just the data from July till now, which is about six weeks of data. We've had 26 kids from our practice that have turned up positive at one of our three test sites. So that doesn't include the Walgreens and other hospitals and schools and states. We've had 26 positives just among our own patients. Um, among those 26 kids, we have five kids who are asymptomatic. They were getting surgery or something, and so they got routine tested, and they showed up positive as well. So it's out there. Now, although I'd like to say kids do just fine when they get COVID, that's also not the case. And we pulled the data for the last year from Maine Medical Center. We've had 39 patients who are pediatric ward patients who are all positive with COVID. Um, they were mostly school age patients. Some had to be hospitalized for acute infections. Some were hospitalized for what they call multi-system inflammatory syndrome in kids, MISC. Uh, some have been hospitalized with simple respiratory issues. Um, all the kids that were seen with multi-system disease uh, were healthy baseline kids. And unfortunately, we haven't had any deaths at Maine Medical Center amongst kids, but we don't understand this disease for the long period of time. We know that some kids are having cardiac effects. We just don't know how long that's going to go afterwards or if it'll continue forever. We know that some people are getting affected by the long haul syndrome, and we don't understand that what does as far as mental health or fatigue or other aches and pains or things downstream for the brain. So the number one thing, as I said, is we immunize our, pa our students, patients, faculty, visitors who can actually qualify for the vaccine. It might be a little bit further before we get it for kids who are younger than age 12. And then the second thing is wearing our masks, especially in the indoor setting where ventilation is decreased. So I do support this plan that's been put forward. I especially support the mask policies that are universal among students, visitors, staff, regardless of their vaccination status. And that's consistent with the CDC's policy and recommendations as well. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you very much. Does anyone have specific questions for Dr. Fanberg? Alicia. Dr. Fanberg, I'm wondering if um, uh, there you have any difference of opinion in the age groups of for students over 12 versus under 12 and the availability of the vaccine more, well, that it's more available to students over 12. It's available to students over 12. Um, I guess I'm not sure what the question is there, so. Well, I, um, I'm just wondering if, the, if you have a difference of opinion uh, depending on the availability of the vaccine to our different student groups. Yep, as far as how we apply but all the policies that are being put forward, no, I think we should apply them universally across all ages at this point, regardless of vaccination status. Um, I might be singing a different tune if we weren't seeing the prevalence of COVID increase or if everybody was actually vaccinated. Um, I definitely would be singing a different tune if we could vaccinate all the kids under 12 as well simultaneously. Um, not this time. Okay, thank you. One of the other um, uh, concerns I've heard widely from parents is um, about the risks to their children because of masking. And I'm wondering, and that has included posits of um, 
medical risks and um, mental health risks. And I'm wondering if you can talk about if there are any medical risks for wearing masking and also um, sort of discuss like your risk cost benefit analysis of, of like the mental health impact to kids um, of, for socially for wearing masks versus their, their health risks. Sure. Although there certainly is a perception of shortness of breath that occurs with a mask on. Um, the reality is from a medical standpoint, you're getting the same amount of oxygen with that mask on versus off. Um, and so that perception is misled. I don't have a medical contraindication for wearing a mask. Um, I can say some kids are very challenged by wearing it uh, from a behavioral standpoint with severe development delays or kids under two. And that's why there's been some leniency in those two age groups or the very young age group. Um, uh, but not in the school age group. Um, as far as mental health concerns with a mask, I think anxiety is a real thing. Uh, but I would worry more about anxiety getting COVID than of the mask, to be honest with you. And that's my bigger fear as far as from a health standpoint. Um, there's also good data saying that you can train kids to wear masks that have not worn more masks previously. I think that was more of an addressed issue in the last year where masks were a new thing. Uh, and we at least found um, that kids were better at putting them on than adults were <laughs> and getting used to it and adapting. And the resilience came out um, right away with the kids, which we didn't quite see in adults the same way. I should also touch upon the mental health stuff of not being in school, because that's something we've seen explode over the last year. I can't tell you how many new sets of anxiety kids I've seen, eating disorder kids I've seen, depression kids, suicidal thought kids, um, and they're all in your population um, where they're coming from. I'm an adolescent medicine specialist, and we just uh, we were overrun our counselors with those findings as well as um, our services uh, because of that. Um, I think we do need to normalize school as much as we can and get kids back in school. Uh, there's a degree of isolation that's occurring in the home setting uh, for long periods of time with the remote approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions, Shannon. Um, Dr. Fanberg, as we move forward with this plan um, in the future and then in the coming months, if we saw a student vaccination rate of 75% or higher, so really we're talking at the high school level, right at this point, um, would you recommend at that point we can look at the mac masking recommendations or do you, how, how long do you foresee? I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> tell, me what, tell me what the prevalence of COVID in the area is at the same time and that would give you better indicators. So if you tell me the prevalence of COVID went way down uh, and immunizations were way up, and uh, I think that's when we have to reassess things. I suspect the state CDC would be given some guidance at about that point as well. Other questions for Dr. Pamberg specifically? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you so much, Dr. Pamberg. Um, if you don't mind sticking around for the, for the rest of our workshop, just in case something comes Sounds up, good. but we, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to other board questions, um, questions for Diane or Jeff, um, general statements about the plan. Um, Anyone want to kick us off? Nick? Oh, sure. Thank I'm just turning you. on my microphone. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, thank you for a very thorough presentation. And I particularly uh, enjoyed the, the table because a visual just helps so much when you're looking at the impact of this pool testing and seeing where the yeses and where the noes are. And I think we have, I have a much better understanding of that now after reviewing that table. My question I actually wanted to ask, and this might bring Dr. Fanberg back into the conversation but um, was actually about the pool testing because as I was reading about it and, and seeing it as an optional thing, which I think is, is fine, but I'm just wondering how that impacts the overall efficacy of a pool testing strategy where the idea is to test a, a pool of people and say, okay, that classroom's all set because they, you know, they all, in my mind, I'm thinking of all these swabs in a jar, which is, may or may not be what's happening. But I'm um, just wondering with having some people opting out of that, if that pokes holes in the efficacy of that strategy at all, or if it still is robust um, with that kind of optional angle. Dr. Fanberg, say, that sounds like a Dr. Sorry, Fanberg. I should have asked <laughs> That's all right. I'm happy to answer oh, that's it. Perfect. Um, so it's early detection. That's what pool testing is all about. The earlier you find this, the few people that are getting, that are going to get it uh, without spreading. And as I showed you with the 26 positives in my population, five of them were asymptomatic. So that's 20% of the population were roaming around without knowing they had the disease. 
Um, so if we can pick those kids up earlier and separate them, the better off we are. And so, um, yes, that plays a role. Now, pool testing is more effective if everybody participates than just some kids, but it does have some degree of effectiveness, even if some kids participate. Um, I think the state was giving us numbers between 10 and 25 people per pool, if I recall correctly. Well, yes, that's correct. Well, I would imagine with a population that we have that could be vaccinated, our older students, those students, as you said in your own words, Dr. Feinberg, have less severe um, symptoms. And so the possibility of having someone walk around being kind of a, an asymptomatic carrier, I hate to say it like that, but mm -hmm. it's probably higher, which makes this pool testing even more important. I think that's very accurate. Remember, COVID is um, layers of protection that we're trying to do. None of these is perfect. Vaccine is not perfect. The mask is not perfect. The pool test, and the, but the more layers of protection we have, the overall statistical benefit of protection that we put in place. I'm going to piggyback on Nick's question, not specifically for Dr. Fanberg this time, but for administration um, in terms of you know, what do we do if we have um, higher participation in some sections of our school or grades? I mean, what, what do we do if pool testing has a higher buy-in at one of our primary schools than our others? Like, do we have a strategy for this in terms of making sure that this is, you know, a process that is being utilized to you know, the most benefit for our kids? Yeah, uh, you know, again, um, you know, we have been making some preliminary plans um, and we met with our nurses, um, gosh, I think probably a week and a half or almost two weeks ago, I'm meeting with them again tomorrow. And so, you know, we have started having some conversations about that and doing some planning about what that would look like, but there certainly isn't, um, we recognize that there are going to be different numbers in different places. Um, and the value of having an extra staffer to coordinate this will be helpful. Um, as, as you all know, we also are very fortunate to have school nurses in each of our schools. Um, and when we first started talking about pool testing, we were really upfront in saying um, our, our school nurses, not unlike any of our other school staff last year worked extremely hard and very diligently. And so as we plan forward for this, it really did not seem right to have it be one more thing on their plate. And so to have some dedicated staff to help with that. Um, and we also, you know, know that no one person can do that, but having a dedicated person to, you know, be at the head of that. And then, you know, to have myself, the medical team um, and all of us pitching in um, towards that effort, I think that it is worth uh, the time that it would take in which to do so. Well, we were, we were really heartened by the response, 66%. Um, and, that, and that was consistent K through 12, whether it, was. It was, whether it was a high school child or a second grader or a first grader or a fifth grader. So, um, and that there was, a, you know, only a 17% who were said, no, nope, not, not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to do it. So, and it's also a rolling thing. So, you know, it's not like you have to sign up by September 1st or you're out, right? So it's, it's people can be added to the, to the program as, as we were to implement it. Um, and as Dr. Fanberg was pointing out, it, it, you know, it's maybe not be, the efficacy may not be as high if everyone in the class were doing it. Um, but those, if you think about it, even if two thirds of our students K to 12 were part of the uh, pool of testing program, that's two thirds of our kids who are getting, who are getting regularly tested, whether they're experiencing symptoms or not. And, and that in and of itself is a powerful mitigation measure. And as, as, as any, any school nurse or, or, or health services person in the school will say, the fewer people that you need to call as close contacts in quarantine, um, the easier your job is. So in the short term, I think ramping up pool testing will be definitely time intensive and I don't want to underestimate the logistics behind it. Right. But the whole idea is to minimize disruption, minimize the number of kids that need to go into quarantine and ultimately minimize the number of kids who either test positive for COVID or need to miss school. Other questions, Shannon and then Gabby. Um, 
I have a few, so I'm going to ask this one because it's in regard to the pool testing. If somebody is, I, I understand they're rolling signups, right? They can sign up anytime. But if somebody is a deemed a close contact and they have not enrolled, so yeah. if we look at the chart, they may be then required to quarantine. If they ask to to sign up at that point, they still would quarantine and then involve, be involved with the pool testing? Is right, that that's correct. correct. So for that one time, they would be subject to quarantine, right? Like, so for example, let's say it's a high school student um, who didn't sign up for pool testing and now they're placed into quarantine. The question has come up, well, can a parent just take their kid to Walgreens right. mm -hmm. and have them tested? And would that be accepted? Again, we're having to work within the requirements mm -hmm. of the state um, and they tell us how we need to do that. And that question has been asked and the answer to that um, to date is no, that would not um, release them from that quarantine. However, um, the parent could certainly choose at that point to sign them up so that that would be the one and only quarantine, right? right. And that they yeah. wouldn't be subject to that continuous, continuously as we saw, you know, to be true for many um, individuals last year. Right. Well, I would just add to that scenario, if it was a classroom exposure and there wasn't any direct contact because we have the universal masking requirement in place, they, they would be considered a close to contact in a, in, and in a community quarantine, but could still come to school. Mm -hmm. to Gabby? Yes. yes. Go ahead, Gabby. Oh, you're on mute. Um, um, so for the, in terms of um, contact tracing in vaccinated students not having to quarantine, how are we keeping track of like vaccination and like, do you have to send in a proof of your vaccination to the nurses or something like that? So my understanding is that the nurses have access to student vaccinations through a statewide system called IMPACT. And so um, they don't necessarily have to collect that information. Um, and so we would have that on hand. Okay. okay. I believe. Almost all the practice in the state do use IMPACT for a statewide registry. For immunizations, it's not 100. percent There's one large practice in the Portland area that doesn't, but um, uh, almost all of them do. Good information to know. Thank you. I'm going to shift gears just for a second, and then I'll come back to you, sure, Shannon, sure. for more questions. Um, one of the questions that was on our FAQ, and again, um, that's going to be a public document. We will get that posted um, to the website so that the public has access to that. Um, but for discussion purposes, one of the questions that we saw a lot that was a question of my own um, is what happens um, if a student does have to quarantine this year, considering we are planning for a return to full in-person learning? Um, and so what are the supports that are going to be in place and, and what does that look like? What does quarantine look like for the kids? So we have all of our um, principals here this evening. And so um, again, that is going to look a little bit different at different schools, um, but uh, they have designated staff to support students during quarantine. Again, um, I am going to really reiterate that if we vote to have universal masking, no student would need to quarantine during the school day. And so the only students who would not be in class would be those students who test positive. Because by having a universal test, a, a universal mask requirement, schools um, automatically are not subject to quarantine. Correct, Jeff? Right, and unless they were deemed a close contact from a community exposure. Right, um, right. But so if, if they had a, exposure outside school, that's right. Great point. If it's a school school based exposure, that universal masking requirement allows them to continue to attend school in person, even if they're considered a, um, a close contact this and they're is, not vaccinated. This is if they are in the pool testing or just regardless. 
if we have a universal masking requirement, no student, I can go back to the chart and show it to you, um, would be subject to quarantine during the school day. Okay. The pool testing changes things in regards to after school activities and athletics okay. at this point. Perfect. And again, this is hot off the press, fresh information that we received on <laughs> four days ago, late on days Friday ago. afternoon, okay. Okay. right? And so as we have done in the last 18 months, we continue to pivot. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And read fast. <laughs> if yes. it would be helpful to hear some snippets from our principals, we would be happy to have them kind of just give you an overview of, of what that would look like if students were in isolation. I'm a, I mean, I, I'm satisfied mm -hmm. for, for my purposes and for my question. Um, I, I would maybe encourage the public that if they still have that question to reach out to the building principals um, mm -hmm. and the building principals will have that information. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna go to Sarah and then come back to you, Shannon. Is that okay? All right, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks. I, I just wanted to, sorry, I don't mean to uh, harp on this point, but it, so the quarantine is only required if you test positive and then the length of the quarantine goes basically until you have a negative test result. Is that accurate? So as you only have to quarantine for, if for school related exposure, if you test positive, so you would actually be in isolation, not in quarantine, right? And the length of that is the same as it always has been. So it's a 10 day from the, you know, from the date of that um, exposure or positive test. And if you have a community based exposure, then you would be in quarantine. Gotcha. Okay. I think, I think it was the isolation quarantine that was running me off. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Shannon, go ahead. I have my slew of questions that I see we're running low on time. So That's I'm going okay. to go to two, my two ones. So my first is, that once again, like Sarah said, not to harp on the, the chart here, but is a, did the exceptions work hand in hand? So by that, I mean, if we, if we vote on the universal masking and the pooled testing, and we have a vaccinated student, if they're deemed a close contact, does that mean because they're vaccinated, they are not a, not quarantine from school events and activities? If they're vaccinated? Yes. Correct. Okay. There's no, right, there's no quarantine, no, no community quarantine, there's no extracurricular sports quarantine or exclusion, no. and there's no, right, if you're vaccinated, um, you're not quarantined as a close contact. Okay, perfect. And then my next question on, um, on your, the slides 15 and 16, when you talk about special services, the students with the IEP um, plan or 504 plans, I see that they um, can utilize some of the services remotely. Um, has there been consideration given to um, those that have been, those students with an IEP that have been deemed, um, the, 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 the teachers and the staff have deemed that they work better remotely? Has there been any thought or consideration given to letting them continue, those students continue to do remote work, or are they only going to be, or the services that they will be able to use, are we talking more in the way of meetings and plans? As far as, as far as any remote learning or remote instruction, it would, it would only be as if that was a modification as part of their 504 plan or IEP plan. If it so if written, it is a modification? If it, was, if, it, if it was written into their IEP or, or 504 plan, so then we as would, it would, we would be, continue. you know, even before COVID. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Kristen. I had a quick question back to the exposure. Is an exposure at an athletic event considered a community exposure or is that considered an at-school exposure? Does it matter? If it's a school sports team, then it's a school exposure. If it's community services or a private club team, it's community exposure. Even if it's like playing another town? That would still be considered a school exposure. As a, as a school athletic event, yeah. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions. 
or comments? I have one other one. I think go for it, Kristen. Great question. You're up. Um, are we back to the schools being open to all visitors? Provided they're wearing a mask, a mask. indoors. Go for it, Shannon. Okay, one question and one 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 ask. My question is, um, we are not, I, I don't see it, so I just want to verify. We're not allowing, the plan does not call for medical opt-outs for masks. Is that correct? So parents cannot medically release their children from wearing masks at school. Right. Okay. And then my ask is, can we... Um, uh, review this. Uh, if we adopt this plan, can we review this on a monthly basis at the board meeting so that we all here in the community hears where we stand? I mean, it might be that some months there are no updates, right? And it might be that some are significant, but can we, can we just pop that in as an ongoing? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I also would imagine that as we did last year, we'll provide regular community updates in our district newsletters as well. Yeah. Good, good question. Happy to accommodate that. So good question. Other comments or questions? Okay, the workshop portion is wrapping up. Um, this is an action item for us um, as part of our business meeting. Uh, I will probably ask for a motion to uh, approve the plan as presented, um, which will include universal masking and acceptance of um, initiating a pool testing program. Um, and so if everyone feels comfortable and, and feels like you've gotten your workshop questions answered, that's great. Um, and we will have time for discussion um, before the vote too. Okay, so with that, I am gonna go ahead and wrap up the workshop. We have two minutes to seven. So if everyone would like to take a quick break, um, you can feel free to do that. And at seven o'clock, we will reconvene um, for our business meeting. Two minutes, all right. Stretch, good job. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not used to it, man. It hasn't, hasn't been messed up. Much. It's an extended mask break. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and call the business meeting to order. Today is Thursday, August 19th, 2021. Uh, it's a little after 7 p.m. And we have just completed our workshop. So we've already had roll call and said the pledge. Um, I do want to apologize to the community. Um, we are continuing to have technical difficulties with streaming on YouTube. That's one of those things that I we, you know, we just held the whole workshop. And of course, I don't know that we're not streaming on YouTube until the workshop is over and someone comes up to me and says, oh, by the way, that wasn't on YouTube. So my apologies to the community um, that we lost our feed. This meeting is being recorded um, directly by us um, on Zoom, which means that we can post the meeting promptly tomorrow. Um, there won't be any waiting on that um, like we have had in the past. So again, I apologize if you tried to watch on YouTube. Um, for those who would like to participate in the meeting, both in person and on Zoom, those two functions um, clearly are working. Um, and so really it's just the ability to watch the meeting from home. Um, and like I said, we will get that um, up and posted on the website. So if you are watching from home because you joined on Zoom, um, we will get that YouTube, um, sorry, the Zoom link posted so that people can watch the workshop later, um, later on. Agenda item 2.0 is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments this evening? Uh, no adjustments. Thank you. Agenda item 3.0 is public comment on agenda items. I will be running public comments similar to how I've done it the last several meetings. Um, Anyone who is signed in as an attendee on Zoom is welcome to make a public comment. Um, you have a little blue hand feature on Zoom. You should be able to raise your hand if you would like to make a public comment. Um, if you are in the room and you would like to make public comment, I would ask that you please form a queue. Um, we'll just give each person their three minutes, regardless of whether you're in person or on the computer. We did have several um, emails come in from people who were wishing to have their email read into the public record. That was a service that we set up back in the spring um, when public meetings were, uh, in-person meetings rather, were not um, accessible to us. At this point, um, it's something that we've talked about at policy, whether that's something that we want to continue. It is the chair's discretion whether or not we want to take public comment via email. Um, because we have not um, restored fully our abilities to both um, get the meeting broadcast on YouTube and Zoom and be in person, I'm going to continue to allow um, public comments to be read into the record via email. I will ask, however, if you are signed into Zoom um, and you submitted a public comment via email that you do read your own public comment rather than having um, Kelly Johnston read it. And with that, I will go ahead and turn public comment over to the people. I'm not seeing anyone um, in person and I'm not seeing any blue hands raised um, on our meeting. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kelly. Um, and, and Kelly, if you could just do two, um, I think there are four total. Um, five, and then I will turn it over back to YouTube, uh, back to Zoom rather, and then we'll go back to Kelly. All right, this first one is from Alan Townsend. Dear school board members, I'm the parent of a second and ninth grade student who attends Scarborough Public Schools. I want to express my strong opinion that everyone in schools this year should be required to wear masks. 
The Delta variant has become a very serious health crisis and masking will help reduce the spread and reduce the number of students who will have to miss school due to the quarantines. When the crisis debates, the mask requirement should be reconsidered, but for the time being, it should remain in place. I know some people are fed up with the mask and I think they are essential to ensure that we can have in-person school five days per week. I fear that without mask requirement, we'll have far more days when students can't attend school because they will be quarantined or worse, sick with COVID. I also strongly support regular pool COVID testing with required individual testing for those in a pool that yields a positive test. For those who are close contacts of people who test positive, quarantine and testing recommendations from public health officials should be followed. Thank you. This second one is from Elise Cherello. Good morning. I'm not sure I'll be able to be there this evening, so I wanted to send this message to the board. The reason why I'm writing this is to give you my input regarding masks for children. It's my husband and I's wish that we have the option and decision-making ability to mask our children. Our junior is vaccinated and we feel there is no need for her to be masked. Additionally, for our first grader, we know, do not want her to be masked. From the data I have seen, and try not to make this political, kids in private and periodical schools in urban areas went to school last year. Kids in public schools in GOP governed areas also went to school and even got to play sports mask free and everything turned out okay. States with open schools didn't have more child COVID cases and certainly not more hospitalizations or deaths. Schools without mask mandates didn't have significantly more COVID cases. They simply put kids first. I know everyone is talking about this new variant, but I believe that it's time we talk about what the children actually need and assess the risks and damage that we are doing by not providing them full time learning last year and insisting they wear masks this year. Thank you for your time in reading and considering this email. Thank you. I'm actually not a host on the Zoom. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and take public comment from in-person folks, and then I will go ahead and promote a few people from the Zoom meeting. I actually sent an email to the board. I didn't ask to have it read, but I'm gonna read just a little of what I wrote. Um, so, could you, I, I'm sorry, could you state your name, please? Debbie please? Dembski. Thank you. Um, and um, one of the points that I think is really important to me is that individual families can't be effective in protecting their children alone when a child's part of community time, like being at school. So when a mask is worn, it not only helps to protect the wearer, but as importantly, it protects others. So when mask wearing is optional, those not wearing a mask don't reciprocate protecting others. Others are put at unnecessary risk as are the individuals themselves when not wearing a mask around others. I'm really grateful to live in Maine. I think our conservative measures have helped to keep Maine one of the safest states in the country. And the numbers around kids, I mean, for a long time we heard kids didn't get COVID, but now you can see across the nation, you know, ICUs are filled with children. And I think what is many of the people who now have got COVID didn't ever think they wanted to be vaccinated or didn't really take it seriously. But then when it hits them or it hits their family or it hits a loved one, it really makes it real. And I know for us personally, I mean, we know people kind of down the road, not real close who have had COVID, but we still believe it really happens. I don't know how we can say that it doesn't. And so anything we can do to protect our kids, we certainly support. And in terms of kids um, having a hard time with masks, I think a lot of that has to do with how we model as adults and the messages that we put out. You know, I've seen, uh, kids as young as three with cancer with masks on and they 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 deal with that we've seen tons of our kids play sports with masks on because they're motivated they want to play sports so they do it kids don't like them but they would rather come to school than um, not be able to come to school so they're willing to wear the mask so I think the messages that we present to kids makes a big difference in how they'll receive them. So I definitely support masking. And I don't, this is just a question that I have around pooling. Um, I'm trying to picture all these kids sticking these things up their noses and how that doesn't somehow put virus into the environment. 
So that's just a, a question. I've researched and researched and can't find anything. And it just, just seems weird. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead, Dr. Joy? Okay. Um, so my name is Jennifer Jubilis and I'm a Scarborough resident. I'm a parent of a student in our schools and I'm also a pediatric infectious disease physician. Um, by now you guys have heard from me ad nauseum, um, many letters describing science and statistics. You've all heard me say that the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommend universal masking in schools. And you've heard me describe the over 400 children who've died nationally with COVID infection and that's with mitigation protocols in place. You heard me describe risks of heart inflammation, renal dysfunction, intestinal dys dysfunction, and give statistics explaining how many children have suffered. Children are currently being hospitalized at alarming rates across the country. So I really appreciate this proposed plan for helping to keep our kids safe. Today, I'm not going to focus on statistics. Today, I'm going to explain what it's like as a pediatric ID doctor to care for a COVID patient. You will hear many, many people say that kids do not get sick with COVID. And I can tell you unequivocally that this is false. Kids can and do get sick with this. And my colleagues and I have seen this with our own eyes and have cared for these kids with our own hands. We wear personal protective equipment which covers our face in a large hood and which blows air through the hood. This makes it virtually impossible for our patients to see or hear us. Imagine being sick enough that you can't breathe and being surrounded by strangers with their faces covered and their speech incomprehensible. Then imagine being a child in this situation. Medicine and healing were not meant to be practiced by faceless and voiceless healers. Parents often can't be at the bedside. So after caring for their children, we call the parent to update. Some parents are angry, which I understand. They are scared and we're the easiest people to blame. Some parents shut down and become almost robotic in their dealings with their child's healthcare providers. And a lot of parents cry. All want to know how this happened. All want to know what additional things we can do and all are scared. The helpless feeling of trying to comfort a parent over the phone is one I will not soon forget. Healing and medicine were not meant to occur over the phone. With the Delta variant, we are seeing more children hospitalized both nationally and here in Maine. Schools are essential to child well-being, and to keep them open and to keep children safe, I am pleading with you to follow the science, accept this plan, follow the AAP and CDC guidance and require masks in the schools. I have so many fears about this pandemic, and right now my biggest fear is a rise in hospitalizations, especially among children who cannot yet be vaccinated. I would give anything never to put on the PPE again and to never have to make another phone call to a parent, but I know it's inevitable. Right now, what this plan does and what I am begging you to accept is to keep our kids in this town safe. I don't want to have to care for a friend's child or one of my child's friends. Over 400 children have died from this and that was with masking and distancing in place. Maine children have become ill. Some have almost died. Some of these children have pre-existing medical conditions, some do not, but my question is, does that really matter? All of our children deserve to be protected. Masking in schools as per AAP and CDC guidelines and the proposed reopening plan is the way to keep schools open, keep kids learning and prevent unnecessary tragedy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to promote um, Beth Darling to speak. Beth, you should be able to unmute yourself and begin your public comment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Not um, used to this. I did send an email and um, in the past, you know, when we learned that there would not be remote learning this coming year, um, that became very difficult to make a decision as to how we're moving forward with school for our granddaughter. I am her guardian. And I sent some emails uh, and was um, suggested that I reach out to you folks, the board members. Um, there were 17 students in my granddaughter's second grade remote class at Eight Corners this past year. And none of those families of which I'm aware opted to change to the hybrid option during that entire year. Uh, there must be other families in the district who feel the same way that we do. All of the money, efforts, technology, and training that were put into making remote hybrid learning available last year will be wasted. It established a method of learning that students like our granddaughter found worked best. We experienced much fewer behavioral issues than previous years, and even her teachers agreed that she did much better through remote learning. Now the rug has been pulled out from under these students, especially those with challenges like our granddaughter. 
Another consideration is that we're a set of grandparents with underlying health conditions caring for our grandchildren and don't want any additional viruses. I'm sure you can understand. We've already had one scare this spring and don't want another. I personally had to have monoclonal antibodies infusion because I had COVID. And if something happens to us, what will happen to them? Our Scarborough taxpaying family in particular does not appreciate the decision of what uh, of doing away with remote learning. Other school districts are still offering the remote learning option as well. It may alleviate the school space issue that we've seen mentioned in the newspapers recently. And yes, now we're forced to look at other remote online options for which we'll have to pay extra. Some of them are five grand at least a year. Since we learned from this past year that remote, the remote method that you were offering just two months ago suits our granddaughter's learning style and her needs best. All four of our now adult children attended Scarborough schools and we were looking forward to having our granddaughter attend as well. Such a shame that this excellent school district, highly valued and highly ranked, is giving up this opportunity to meet the needs of some of their special students. Perhaps the remote learning requirement should be added to the, her IEP in order to meet her needs, no student left behind, right? And I did hear a little mention earlier, um, I don't remember exactly what was shared uh, regarding those that are on IEPs um, and can they continue remotely if a modification was written into their plan I think there was another question and I missed it. And if you could help me out with whatever that was that was discussed, then I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kelly, I'm gonna go back to you, please. Dear school board, I'm submitting this public comment to be read at the August 19th school board meeting. I respectfully ask Scarborough schools require face covering indoors for all students, teachers, staff, and visitors, unless they have a medical exemption. Sorry, I can't see. <laughs> as we begin the school year, as recommended by the CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, and Maine Department of Education. Face coverings are an important step in limiting the spread of COVID. A face covering's purpose is to protect others from the wearer's secretions, meaning they are most effective if they are worn by all. My child wearing a face covering in a space where others are not wearing a face covering protects others from the exhale, exhaled breath of my child, but does little to protect my child from the exhaled breath of others. I encourage the school board to mandate face coverings indoors at Scarborough schools out of respect for everyone entering our schools. Data indicates that the Delta variant is one, more transmissible, two, impacting children more than previous COVID variants, and three, being transmitted by fully vaccinated people who may be asymptomatic. Universal face coverings indoors can help our kids, help keep our kids safe and in the classroom. I'm also in favor of pool testing along with masking and have signed both of my children up for pool testing during the recent survey sent to parents. I truly hope that COVID controls, including mask wearing and pool testings, will be short-lived because of COVID transmission rates in Maine and across the country decreases as the school year progresses. Until then, I am in full support of face coverings for all, regardless of vaccination st status and pool testing. Thank you for your time and dedication to keeping our Scarborough school community safe. Joanna Wallace. This is from Ashley McPherson. Good evening. Like many other parents in this town, I have major concerns with my child wearing a mask all day while at school. He already missed out on his entire first grade year a whole year of not making friends, going to his favorite classes, seeing teachers and learning in a classroom. Remote learning does not work. They do not get the same time and attention as the children do at school. Young children being taught through a screen is not only extremely detrimental to their developing brains and mental health, but they are missing out on the opportunity to actually learn. You don't see the effect it has on these children, but the struggles of remote learning, seven-year-olds breaking down from the frustration of learning through a screen and not having their teacher there to help them or friend to talk to. The end of the school year, we were told by you, it would be our own personal choice if we wanted our children to wear a mask. We should have a say in what is right for our children. 
There's no science that proves that masks work, but there is actual proof that our children are falling behind on their education and the mental effect it has on them. Sincerely, a concerned parent and town resident. One more, Kelly. Yeah, sure. This is to the Scarborough School Board. It is absolutely criminal to make a young child sit in a classroom setting with a mask on for eight hours. Who are you protecting here? Your vaccinated teachers? This makes absolutely no sense. If your concern is the health of children, how have you not considered their mental health? We have no idea what the long-term social, mental, and developmental ramifications will be from the prolonged mask enforcement. But we do know that children do not contract COVID. And if there were no carriers, isn't that what the vaccine is for? My sister chose to keep her son homeschooled last year, not out of fear of COVID. It was from the fear of the mental health, mental anguish caused by the mask. The at-home learning was an absolute joke. This is not how kids learn. Have you ever seen a child cry because they don't understand their homework or break down because they miss their friends or cry because they have to wear a mask? This is not normal, nor is it okay. You're all doing the children of Scarborough such a disservice and should be ashamed of yourselves. Children are falling behind in so many ways. You have the power to change this. Please do the responsible thing makes masks optional. Parents should have a say in what's best for their children. This has gone too far. Sadly, deeply saddened and disappointed, Lindsay McPherson. Thank you, Kelly, for reading our public comments that were sent to us via email. I'm gonna go ahead and take the people who are in person. And then I have a few more people, one more person who has their hand currently raised um, on Zoom. Hi, my name is Todd Jamison. I am the parent of a third grader who will be entering Wentworth School. Um, actually pretty happy to be out in a public forum. First time I've worn pants in <laughs> quite a while. Um, uh, I'm not gonna get into the science and I don't really have anything prepared. I'm not gonna get into the science on masks working, not working. I do have a face covering. It doesn't stop my eye rolls from the last two emails. Um, but I am more, about a plea about not just the kids that were um, asking to wear a mask, it's about the people that are in the homes. My wife is a severely immunocompromised um, type one diabetic. She has an autoimmune disease and she's now had her third vaccine. She had her uh, booster shot earlier today, uh, but because of her autoimmune disorders, it's not, uh, it's not a, a given that the vaccine is gonna work. So to not have our children protect not only themselves, but those that are in their homes, uh, their parents, their grandparents, those who have had cancer treatments. I think all of us in this room want to do best for our child and are teaching our children uh, compassion, uh, to be a better person, to be a good human, to care for others. The best way for our children to care for the community is to wear a mask. Um, and the one question I would have, and this, I don't know if this gets answered now, will teachers have to be required uh, to have vaccines? Um, I, I know that you're probably not allowed for, for HIPAA reasons to, to tell if a teacher is vaccinated, uh, but it would be very helpful to know what the percentage of, of teachers that will be vaccinated uh, at the end of the year. And to further on the remote uh, learning, if for some reason, uh, we do get into a larger COVID breakout. Will we be reinstituting potential remote learning for students? Thank you. Thank you very much. And just for the public's knowledge, um, if you're new to attending meetings or new to making public comment, this isn't designed to be a back and forth. Um, but uh, if you have follow up questions, please email the board and I will be happy to get um, in touch with you or put you in touch with the right person. All right. I'm John Anderson, Five Owens Way. I am part of the town council, but I'm not here representing them. I'm, I'm here as a parent. Um, I wanted to share tonight that I support the plan that was presented earlier in the workshop. Uh, the past year, both my kids were full-time virtual in kindergarten and second grade. This year, they're going to first and third. You know, that was the decision my wife and I made to keep them safe because I always tell my kids that my job is to make sure that they feel loved and make sure that they feel safe. And I really do feel like the plan that was put forward tonight helps me deliver on that job of keeping them safe. So I really do support the mandatory masking, the pool testing. Today, they got their teacher assignments and they're super, super excited. There were emails swirling around with parents and my son is especially super excited to see his friends that he hasn't seen for the past year. So please pass this plan as it was presented tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Josh Pobrislow, Three Grapevine Lane. I uh, emailed a letter, but I'll read it in such a format so you don't have to read it later. <laughs> Uh, my name is Josh Pobrissel. I'm a local health officer, paramedic, and father of two children in the Scarborough School District. I am writing with concerns on my current understanding of the masking guidance being provided by the town of Scarborough for the summer rec program and what foreshadowing that may have on the rapidly approaching 2021-22 school year. I did not object to the changing of the mask mandate at the end of the state of emergency, as all indications in the CDC data suggest the community, the state, and the county were making progress to, in ending the pandemic. However, we have seen a sig significant change in the trajectory, and the Delta variant is now causing a fourth wave of infections. Worse still, we are seeing changes in the impact this variant has on our most vulnerable population, children under 12 that cannot be vaccinated. We are seeing an increasing number of children testing positive for COVID-19 and reports of children being sicker than we have ever seen before. As a parent of a child under 12 with respiratory issues, this is of alarming concern. Over the past year, we have a nation, state and community have made difficult decisions and taken precautionary measures to protect the adult population when they were at the highest risk. I strongly recommend that we start doing the same for our children now that they are the ones that are unprotected. I implore you to not recommend, but require masks to be worn by all as we are starting off the school year, to once again consider the shielding and distancing that kept our children safe th this past year. We are seeing these practices being implemented in our neighboring communities of South Portland and Portland, both of which have high vaccination rates similar to that of Scarborough's. Perhaps some of the measures are already in the works, soon to be reported out um, to concerned parents. Um, however, if this conversation about the health and safety of the children are not, I implore you to make a swift and protective stand for our most vulnerable population. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and promote um, Andrea Pettit. You'll be speaking first and then Carla M. Amons, I'm gonna call on you next. Mrs. Pettit, you should be able to unmute and give your public comment. Thank you. Uh, yes, Andrea Pettit, Two Crossing Drive. Um, I very much appreciate the time that was spent in the workshop in the first hour. A lot of my questions were answered. Uh, and I know, April, you had said that this isn't necessarily a back and forth instance, but I did feel a big hole in the conversation around what the masking process will be for recess. It seemed like the underscore was masking will be universal indoors and not a talk about what happens when they're outside. Um, so, you know, again, not a back and forth, but that to me is just a piece of the puzzle that would be missing with this proposal. Again, thank you all for the time that you put into this and um, a lot of questions were answered for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Mrs. Emmons, you should be able to, yep. I can. Hi, my name is Carla Emmons and I have a daughter at Wentworth. Um, I'm asking you to support the mandate for masks for all in our schools this fall through mid-January at least. Um, I understand there's no patience for a hybrid schedule, but to simply return to normal practices would be irresponsible at this time. Um, I'm one of the people who kept my child remote last year and um, I would love to give a shout out to her teacher and Mrs. Chin because she, my daughter had a great year and she learned a lot. She engaged with her classmates and we identified some challenges, got her extra help and saw exponential growth in her academics. Um, last year, Scarborough schools overall, we did pretty well all told except after the holiday breaks because of masking and spacing and ventilation and um, reducing the risks of COVID transmission. 
um, right now, we're looking at the number of pediatric cases um, is rising week over week, and we don't really know what the long-term side effects will be for COVID in children. Um, we're seeing more pediatric hospitalization now than at any pre prior time during the pandemic, and that scares me. Um, the pandemic is not over for our unvaccinated kids, and we need to do everything we can to keep them safe and healthy. Um, the easiest step is to mandate masks for everyone in our schools. And I really hope we can continue with this plan. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? Go ahead. Good evening, my name is Jenna, uh, Jenna Leung. I am actually running for school board this year. Um, I have two kids in the program in public schools, uh, three kids all together. So one is going to be Wentworth and one is going to Eight Corners. Um, one thing that I am noticing that this year is that parents sending their kids are aware of their risks and have lost their patience with how schools have been running. I've heard kids in public school this year, one of which says she doesn't wanna to go to school because she can't talk to her friends. She can't see their faces. Um, she can't talk to them during lunch, which is really pathetic in my opinion, since I am an educator and that's literally their only unstructured time during the day. This is just not normal. And as an educator, we tell parents to model behavior and we're modeling anxiety and poor coping skills as parents. As an educator of students with special needs as well, I am seeing a trend in anxiety, suicidal ideation, anger. And I fear we will see more children regressing and probably requiring more IEPs if we don't open up normally, as normal as possible. Um, one issue that we're running into here that I'm noticing is parents are not being given options. Um, I think we should make masks optional, make a virtual option. I don't support pool testing either because in, it, you know, private schools are successfully accommodating the needs of families right now without these testing measures. Um, I think this will just manufacture illnesses when our kids are feeling fine and we are going to be punishing them, denying them an education because now they have to quarantine at home and not be with their friends. Um, I think not being as normal as possible is irresponsible for us. Thank you very much. With that, I'm not seeing anyone else on Zoom and there's no one else in person standing in line. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment for this evening. Thank you to everyone who came out and spoke. I know that that is not always the easiest thing to do and we appreciate your time um, as a board. Agenda item 4.0 is the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Um... Covered this, uh, obviously, the, uh, got two things just as part of my report. The first is just uh, um, some quick highlights of the workshop presentation that, that we gave at six o'clock uh, regarding reopening. So um, my first slide just has a couple bullets or a few bullets, um, highlights of what we covered. So that, uh, the key part of our plans being the universal indoor mask requirement uh, for students and staff K to 12. Uh, as articulated by both federal and Maine CDC uh, and Maine DOE. Um, reviewed some of the facilities preparations to get ready for uh, a full return of all of our students and, and the significance of bringing all of our students back to in-person instruction. As I think everybody's articulated tonight, that's, that's our number one goal. And that's certainly what's um, best for the health and safety and learning of our, of our, of our students and, and, and the overall health of our families. Um, reviewed updated main CDC standard operating procedures with regard to how we respond to any positive COVID cases in schools, which has changed uh, some significant changes. Uh, if, if our plan uh, is adopted by the board, specifically with respect to um, minimizing educational disruption, minimizing um, close contacts and quarantine um, through added mitigation measures of the universal masking, as well as pulled testing, um, we talked about some of the potential for um, uh, challenges for transportation in our transportation survey that, that went out and special thanks to the community for their overwhelming response, both to the survey on pooled testing, but also uh, for transportation. We had some really good data to make sure that we're 
again, minimizing disruption and getting our students back in classrooms and in schools where they belong. Um, we shared also the results of, of pooled testing and then also uh, we'll share publicly um, questions that the, the board had prepared for us and, and prior to this meeting uh, with 16 or 17 questions, a lot of um, questions that people have on themes of things that people have already shared tonight and that the that I've shared with board members in preparation for this workshop and this meeting. Um, and the second part of my report is really, you know, we've we've been really busy, you know, getting ready for the fall. Um, you know, and uh, I, I, as I'm adjusting to my new position as, as your new superintendent, uh, we were able to take two days as a leadership council for our um, leadership institute. And we had two full days, a very full agenda. Um, the, you know, the first day we were able to do some team building and, and really uh, focus on norms of collaboration, how we were going to work together as, a, as, as building leaders and then also as, as a district leadership team. Um, started to talk about some, actually did some, some great brainstorming around where do we start, how do we start uh, thinking about a shared vision for Scarborough Public Schools, where we are and where we'd like to go. Um, and then also articulated some themes around developing and implementing a professional growth model for school and district leaders and how that's going to um, you know, help us engage our own staff in our own buildings and, and their own professional growth and development. Uh, day two was really about the here and now, um, uh, and, and uh, I really appreciate all the thought and input that went into drafting this fall reopening plan that we were able to present uh, elements of uh, this evening at six o'clock during our workshop. There was a lot of um, great input from our leadership council, uh, as well as restart teams that had, that had um, been working throughout last year, you know, certainly prior to my arrival. Um, we also, on that second day, uh, tuned in to an update from uh, the DOE commissioner on uh, updated health and safety guidelines, the, the um, changes made to the standard operation or standard operating procedure document um, that, that we need to use when we're responding to positive COVID cases. We also had an opportunity to coordinate building level me meetings, do some logistics, figure out professional development calendars across the, across the district. Um, and then really start focusing on our return to school in, in terms of orienting new staff. So, the, so um, I'm gonna be sharing also some of our new hires uh, this evening for the board to approve. So we have a lot of um, new educators who are joining our team. We're very excited about that. So new staff orientation planning um, uh, for August 25th, which the first half of the day will be district-wide for all of our new staff. And then they'll be in buildings getting oriented on, in the afternoon. Um, and then and then taking some time to organize and get ready for our staff opening days. So we have two full days of, of, of staff development, August 30th and 31st. And um, we're just really excited to get everybody back in person on campus um, and get ready to, to welcome our kids back. So um, it's, it's just it seems like just like a very exciting time to be able to do that and to do that uh, in person. So that's my update. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Agenda item 5.0 is the chair's report. My chair's report is pretty short and sweet tonight. Um, I just have a couple of community announcements. Um, the first being that nomination papers um, are out. Uh, we have three seats up on the Scarborough Board of Education this year. Each of those seats is a three-year term. And for interested parties, nomination papers are due September 1st, uh, 2021. My second announcement is that last night, the town council voted unanimously to approve first reading of the turf track replacement to go on the November 2nd, 2021 referendum. Uh, that is very exciting news for us as a school department. Um, to give a one second background, the turf and track replacement has gone out to the voters once and did fail. Um, we are in a position now that is much more dire and desperate. Um, we have to have this pass. And so our first step last night was to get town council to approve the um, ballot. They do have a second reading on September 1st, and I may or may not have overcommitted the school department to provide them with a little more detail, um, but we can work that out <laughs> before September 1st. 
Uh, my last announcement is that MSBA, no surprises, right? No. Uh, <laughs> my last announcement is that the MSBA virtual fall conference will be held on October 28th and 29th. I did send an email out to the board just to mark your calendars. Kelly will send out registration requests um, as it gets closer and when the time becomes appropriate, but I did want the board to have that um, on their radar. And tonight we will be choosing our delegate um, as an action item later on in the meeting um, to attend the delegate assembly at that conference. My next um, piece of my chair's report also relates to town council. Um, they are preparing to send a town-wide survey. Uh, it's basically a, sat a citizen satisfaction survey um, out in the fall. Um, it's supposed to go out to 40, paper copies are gonna go out to approximately 4,200 residences. Um, and then there's there also going to be an online option to fill out the survey. But the reason why this is so important is because there is uh, a section for us as a school department um, to be able to gather some feedback. So what I have posted is the sample questions that were provided to us um, by the third party um, sample company. And really what I just wanted to do um, was solicit a little bit of feedback from the board. I did bring this to the communications committee um, earlier this week. And so we have had this discussion at the committee level, um, but I didn't want to, because it's not an action item for us, um, this is more of a discussion. I didn't want to go straight to um, Ken Johnson, who is heading this up on the town council without um, having a little bit of background and, and discussion as a full board. And so the first three questions um, are just standard questions about whether or not people have um, a student in the district. It's actually the next set of questions um, that would really kind of pertain to what information we were looking for um, as a department of the town. These are pretty standard in terms of, um, you know, if you're the police department or public, public works, um, community services has a section. And basically it's just breaking down our department into its finer pieces and then asking residents for their satisfaction. And so um, we can, if people wanna make comments on this now, we absolutely can have a little bit of discussion. I don't necessarily feel like people have to be put on the spot, but I do need to give feedback um, to the town council um, by the next Friday. And so um, basically, what I'm looking for from the board is kind of an up down. Yes, we, we do want to have a section of this survey. Um, and, you know, are we okay with these, with these sections um, being asked? There's a chance that our section is going to have to be whittled down. And so if there are any of these 65 through 74 that you don't feel like are necessarily as valuable as the rest, I think that would be good feedback for me to give to town council. And again, that it doesn't necessarily have to be right this minute, um, but I will be soliciting that over email again before next Friday. Does anybody have any comments or questions about the survey? Nick. It looks pretty comprehensive overall. And I know you just mentioned actually potentially whittling it down, but there are two areas that kind of stand out to me that aren't here. One is food service and one is transportation. So I just didn't know if those would be two things that they'd want to ask anything about. Um, to the people of the town. But I mean, it's a pretty standard scale. It looks, looks good to me as far as the layout. Great. And the feedback that I got from um, Ken Johnson was not to try and wordsmith the questions themselves. Um, that's why they've hired a third party um, person or company to do this, but more just the, the general information. So to your point, we could say we would like to know transportation satisfaction and they would then draft the question. So that's great feedback, Nick. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything else um, for right now? Seeing none, I will go ahead and conclude my chair's report. Agenda item 6.0 is student representative reports. Um, I had talked to Gabby and to Yulia about um, continuing with their student representative reports. And obviously since it's summer, um, they didn't have anything to report this month. Um, and so we look forward to the return of that in September. 
Agenda item 7.0 is community uh, committee reports. Uh, normally we draft up a comprehensive slide deck for each one of our committees. Um, a lot of our committees have been meeting less frequently um, because of the nature of summer, but some people did prepare a slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and let, it looks like Nick go first with negotiations. Sure. And then anyone else, um, you can just raise your hand if you would like to give an update. Yeah, so I mean, as you know, negotiations is usually a bit of a vague update because so much of it is confidential, but I did want to give an overall timeline on the two processes we have going on. So uh, the first is that we met with the SCA on the bus driver's contract this past Tuesday, which was the 17th. Um, as was commented on earlier, we do have a bus driver shortage, and that certainly is part of our conversation um, as we work with that group to come up with their new contract. Um, we had started earlier in the year, the education support professionals contract, which is the ESP. Um, we have gone to mediation for that. We do have a mediator assigned. Our first meeting with the mediator will be on the 25th for five hours uh, between one and 6 p.m. But um, the goal of mediation is to have a non-binding attempt to reach accord uh, through a neutral party. And that does take time. Um, if we are not able to reach accord, then we would move on to fact finding. And so I just want to remind everybody kind of the progression of this. So if we went on to fact finding, the difference there is that a panel of individuals actually makes recommendations for the unsettled areas of the contract, but it's still not technically binding. Um, but if, if we have to go in that direction, that's the next direction after mediation. Um, we are all optimistic that that will not have to happen, but I did want to share it um, just, in, just to remind the community and all the board what our uh, progression is for these different proceedings. Thank you, Nick. Does anyone else have a committee report this evening? Jana. Um, I have one for the communications team. We did meet this week um, to make a plan. We've started brainstorming to make a plan for the turf and track field replacement. So assuming that it is approved at the second reading, this would be an all hands on deck effort to, um, to really, as to your point, April, to really um, make sure that this passes this time. Um, so if uh, we are brainstorming, we're working through ideas um, that we, we came up with as a group as to how best to um, initiate this conversation with the community. Um, so if you have ideas, if anybody has ideas and wants to email us, that would be fantastic. Um, and I think that that's, just make sure, I think that's everything. Any input and any help too, if anybody is interested in helping. It is, um, it's gonna be a, a big project and um, we are working with the town and the schools. And also we would um, like to engage the boosters at the high school and the um, youth sports as well. Great, thank you, Shannon. Is that all for committee reports this evening? Okay, perfect. Uh, agenda item 8.0 is new business. Agenda item 8.1 is the 2021-2022 school reopening plan. Do I have a motion to approve the plan as presented this evening? So moved. Second. Discussion. We'd like to get us started. Nick, go for it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we, we asked a lot of questions during the workshop, so I don't want to rehash any of that, but I do just want to um, actually thank the board member off, I believe, to my left, who brought up the idea of doing regular updates. I think that's going to be really important for our community. I'm so glad you brought it up because obviously this plan is a great reopening plan, but as we've seen over the course of the summer, the trajectory of this virus and its effect on our community could change at any moment. And so I think keeping the community apprised through this board is really important, as well as the other channels that Diane mentioned. Um, so thank you for this plan. But I, I also want to recognize, we did not rehearse this, but I want to recognize <laughs> Shannon for asking, for bringing that up, because I think it's great that we're going to keep the community regularly updated through this board. Other, other comments? Kristen. Um, I'll echo Nick in that I love Shannon's suggestion that we get regular updates and that we're prepared to change the plan mm -hmm. should the need be. Um, you know, I, the masking is a tough one and I personally don't love the idea. I don't think it's an easy thing for every child to just throw a mask on. That being said, I think this universal masking allowing all children to maintain their in-person education is just really 
it's really important. And I think that can't be, you know, when we think back to where we were last year, it's hard to, it's hard to overstate how important it is for these kids to be back in person. And I think as much as I don't love the idea that kids are going to have to wear masks, I think it's probably worth it in this situation. Thank you. Other comments, board member comments, Shannon? And then I'll go to you, Gabby. Um, I think we all probably have thought about this nonstop for the last it, God knows how long. But what I um, keep coming back to, especially at the high school level, is um, in addition to the health concerns, the mental health concerns we have. And if we can, if you look at the chart that Diane and Jeff so graciously provided us, if we if we can do this, if we can maintain, if we can approve this plan as is, it looks like we don't have to take kids out of sporting events. We don't have to take them out of extracurricular activities. We don't have to quarantine as much as we did last year. And we think about the mental health impacts of last year, that's huge. And I don't think we can overstate that enough. The importance of maintaining some semblance of a normal high school and middle school and really elementary school career for our kids. Thank you. Gabby? Yes. Um, so I, I, at first I was like, oh, I really don't want to wear a mask in school. I'm vaccinated. I haven't been wearing one all summer because that's what I've, I've been going off of what is recommended. But I guess after seeing that report, I support the universal masking. I'm just sharing that what I've heard from some of my peers at the high school level, there is frustration that they will be required to wear a mask even though they are vaccinated. And maybe I just hope they can all support, get, support this decision too for universal masking. But I just thought the board should be aware that there is some at least at the high school with the vaccination, there's some talk going around, petitions, I think. Thank you, Gabby. We always appreciate your um, eyes on the ground perspective because <laughs> not all of us have a high school student. Um, Sarah, I'll go to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gabby, for that. I, I do think that's important. And I guess, I mean, I, like I'm frustrated too. I think we're probably all frustrated that we're still in this position that we still have to wear masks, especially that we're vaccinated. But, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's the safest thing to do. And I guess I would just piggyback off of comment that Shannon made, which I think was actually started by one of the, the, the uh, people who spoke during public comment, which is we want to get back to as, as close to normal as we can. Um, and to me, the plan that you guys presented is as close to normal as we can, with the exception that people will be wearing masks. But everything else seems to be pretty back to normal, which I think is great and um, takes care of, all, alleviates a lot of the concerns and the challenges that we had last year uh, with remote and hybrid. So um, I'm going to be supporting this, and I appreciate you guys putting it together in a very clear and concise way. I think that leaves me with the last words here. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck me in the spring when we were expected to make a lot of these decisions um, was not a single one of us is a public health official. You know, we were all elected to, I, I thought at the time, to talk about ed policy and transportation and, you know, figure out what our kids were going to be doing in terms of curriculum. And it, it was never um, even in my wildest dreams that I would be making such um, critical public health decisions and that people were gonna be looking to school boards for answers to those questions. We have public health officials guiding us and thank goodness because they have been giving us guidance for well over a year that has kept our schools safe that has kept our kids healthy. And the most important thing for us to focus on right now is getting these kids back in school five days a week in the most normal conditions that we can provide. I fully support the masking. I understand the frustration, um, absolutely. To, to everyone's point, we all are done. Nobody wants to do this anymore. Um, but, if it means that our kids can resume their 
activities and, and not have to be in quarantine, not have to rely on a remote option. And my kids did fully remote and we thought that it was a great experience, um, but it's, my kids wanna be back in school just as much. So I appreciate um, administration putting this together for us. I also wanna thank it's at least 30 of our school staff who are sitting here um, fully masked, <laughs> looking at us adoringly. Um, we appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we feel incredibly supported as a board. And so for that, you know, thank you very much. With that, um, if no one else has any other comments, I think we're ready to vote, Diane. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Giftis? Yes. Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous. Um, we don't have a lot of agenda items left. But if everyone would like to quietly um, excuse themselves, no one here would blame any of you. I know that um, many of you have an early morning. Um, and so I will go ahead and allow the room to kind of resettle and then um, I'll pick back up in another minute or so. Thank you again for your attendance tonight. Agenda item 8.2 and agenda item 8.3 are the meeting minutes of June 17th, 2021 for our workshop and our business meeting. I'm gonna bundle those into one motion. Do I have a motion to approve as written? So Second. Discussion? And I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Giftis? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Thank you, that's unanimous. Agenda item 8.4 is the MSBA school board delegate. Um, every year at the state school board convention, um, the state school board association pulls together um, a delegation from each of the school boards in the state of Maine who participate uh, to pass a number of resolutions um, that they feel um, warrant state level um, recognition. Uh, we do have the draft list of those um, resolutions. Uh, they were emailed to us. I can make sure that everyone has that. For this evening's purposes, however, we do need to just name a delegate to that assembly. Um, I have participated as the delegate twice. Um, it is a wildly interesting experience um, to say the least. Sometimes it is hours and hours and hours long. Uh, but there's a lot of parliamentary procedure and uh, you get to learn a lot about the viewpoints and the um, different perspectives that different boards have all over the state. So I have always found it um, an enriching experience, uh, not to sound like I'm totally going to geek out over it, but I do like doing it. Um, so this year we will need to select a delegate. Um, I would love to pass it off to someone who has not had the opportunity to do it. Um, and so if I have volunteers, I could take a volunteer. Um, I will say that if we don't have a volunteer, Leanne has offered to do it, um, even though she's not here tonight, she did um, send me an email and let me know that if we didn't have um, interested parties that she would, that she would do it. I'd be interested. You would be interested? Anyone else? 
it brings you so much joy. I wouldn't want to take that away from you. <laughs> I will say I, I, <laughs> I would be happy to do it a third time. Um, but I do think it's a good learning experience for someone else to, to, to take it on. So with that, I will make a motion to approve Shannon Lindstrom as our delegate to the 2021 MSBA Delegate Assembly. Second. Discussion? Okay. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Giftis? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Congratulations, you're gonna have a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Agenda item 8.5 are our appointments this evening. All right, so I'm gonna share uh, with you a little bit about our, uh, our new staff appointments. Uh, for your consideration, the first is a middle school student support and content area teacher. Uh, John LaPerriere has uh, been chosen to fill this position created by a realignment. He received his Bachelor of, Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of Maryland, obtained his Master's of International Relations at Troy State University, and both his Master's of Educational Leadership and his Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study from New England College in New Hampshire. He's been an eighth grade history teacher, sixth grade classroom teacher, an assistant principal, and most recently principal of Gardner Regional Middle School. Um, next up is our middle school behavioral specialist. Uh, Shannon O'Brien has been selected to fill this position created by a non-renewal. Ms. O'Brien earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from South Virginia University and Master's of Science in Educational Psychology from USM. She's been a behavioral specialist for both Biddeford schools and Portland Public Schools, and most recently a behavioral analyst with Spring Harbor, Harbor Hospital. Ms. O'Brien will be, uh, all right, sorry, Eight Corner School Physician, uh, uh, Eight Corner School Physical Education Teacher. Alicia uh, Nemec has been nominated to fill this position created by a retirement. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Physical Education from the University of Maine in Presque Isle, has been a PE teacher in Westbrook Schools, Wayne Fleet School, and Moore Street School in Freeport. Our middle school academic center teacher, Lisa Faris, has been chosen to fill this position created by a realignment. She obtained her Bachelor of Science degree in Human Development and Elementary Education from St. Joe's. St. Joseph's College and her master's in education from Northeastern University. She's been an eighth grade English teacher, an eighth grade civics teacher, and a sixth and seventh grade composition teacher in middle schools in Massachusetts since 2006. Our middle school Spanish teacher, um, Sarah Greer has been selected to fill this position, created by a resignation. Ms. Greer received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Spanish from Michigan State University, anticipates completing her master's of secondary education from the University of Michigan this month. Uh, she completed her student teaching in Michigan, where she taught Spanish to high school students, and she's also been a language instructor in both China and Taiwan. And then Jennifer Bishop, a middle school library media specialist. Um, Mrs. Bishop has earned her Bachelor of Science degree in accounting and economics from West Virginia Wesleyan College and her Master's of Library Science from the University of North Texas. She's been with Saco Schools since 2008 as a library media specialist, a teacher in digital citizenship and intro to coding, and also as the assistant director of information technology. For our K-2 technology instructional coach, Kelsey O'Neill uh, received her bachelor's degree in elementary education from the University of Maine and her master's degree in educational leadership from USM. She's been a classroom teacher for students in grades one and three for nine years. Our halftime middle school health and physical education teacher, Julie Kerrigan Atore, has been uh, earned her bachelor's of science degree in physical education from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. She has worked in several school districts, including Ohio, uh, Virginia, and Washington, DC. She's been a PE teacher, a coach, an associate athletic director, as well as an athletic director. And our Wentworth School classroom teacher, a one-year position, Rhonda Gagayer has been chosen to fill this one-year position. She received her bachelor's of science degree in physical education from the University of Maine in Press. Am I reading this thing? That's not right. Never mind. <laughs> Scratch that. Degree in biology from the University of Southern Maine. 
She's a seventh grade math and science teacher in Lisbon for three years and most recently was a special education ed tech three at the middle school. And that is our uh, appointments for this evening. Excellent. Do I have a move, uh, motion to approve the appointments as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion? Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sizer? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Giftis? Yes. Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Excellent, that's unanimous. Agenda item 9.0 is adjournment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sizer? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Giftis? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Good night, guys. Good night.